Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the four o'clock block um, on a given Tuesday. We're talking community matters here, and we're talking about bigotry in our backyard. My co-host, Peter Hoffenberg, and our special guest, uh, uh, Seth. I can't read it. Oh, Seth Brisk. Okay, it says he, him at the end. I know that's not your name. Okay, welcome, welcome, Seth. Welcome, Peter. Um, okay. Peter, you have you have the uh, the duty of uh, uh, explaining the scope of our show today and introducing Seth. Okay, very very briefly, the scope of the show is to try to come to terms with what seems to be, and the statistics show it is in fact rising intolerance, but not just rising intolerance, uh, rising number of physical attacks, rising examples of graffiti. And uh, quite often, the numbers are attacks on Asian Americans and African Americans and Latin Americans. And I think that is uh, the most significant number. Uh, but Jay and I want to explore some of the examples of anti-Semitism, uh, by no means to diminish other attacks, but to see that anti-Semitism is also part of this tsunami of intolerance. And sometimes people who attack Asian Americans and African Americans also attack Jews for the same kind of racist view. Uh, historically, the group that has been out front, even out front of the federal government, in chronicling and collecting statistics about hate crimes is the Anti-Defamation League. It has a very important place in American history. And we've asked uh, Seth, who's one of the regional, I'm not sure the exact title, coordinator, director, uh, anyhow, we say Macher. He's one of the regional Machers uh, who reaches out to us as part of his uh, regional uh, portfolio. So Seth, if you could talk to us a little bit initially about your sense of why people feel this rising bigotry and rising intolerance. Um, I think it's a general sense around the country. Jay, is that fair enough? The, yes, um, uh, yes, maybe an understatement somehow. Sure. So you just, and, and you notice there's a question in chat basically about that, right? How to explain the the rise of intolerance in the US in recent times. Is sure. this new, greater than before, et cetera? So let me turn it over uh, to Seth. And I don't know whether you're officially representing the ADL or not. Um, OK, great. I, I, I am. We, I we am. have to uh, have, to have that legal outlet if you want a legal well, freeway exit. OK, so let me turn you. it over to Seth and to Jay. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jay. Uh, appreciate being here today to talk to you. Um, as uh, Peter indicated, I, I am the uh, regional director for the ADL that includes uh, all the islands of Hawaii. And um, you know, just by way of introduction, ADL is the world's leading anti-hate organization. Um, our mission has always been to fight against um, hatred directed at the Jewish people, but also all forms of hate um, with the same kind of vigor and passion. And um, you know, we are respected leaders in exposing extremism but also delivering anti-bias education, uh, fighting hate online, and uh, you know, responding to incidents as they occur. And our ultimate goal is to see a world in which no group or individual suffers from bias, discrimination, or hate. Um, but unfortunately, we've been seeing too much of that lately. And there are a number of different statistics you can look at to, uh, to demonstrate that this problem is uh, persistent. And in recent years, it's been rising. So you can look at ADL conducts our own audit of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, these are both lawful expressions of anti-Semitism, but also um, illegal expressions, also known as hate crimes that occur. And for the last four years, we've seen historically high numbers of anti-Semitic incidents occurring. Uh, so what you see before you actually are the hate crimes that have uh, reported by the FBI, but this correlates the, the information that we've been finding. So this graph shows you that in the last four years on record, um, we don't have the record uh, yet for 2021, but for the last four years on record, the FBI has tabulated over 7,000 hate crimes in each of those years. And you can see them rising. And you can see that even uh, the separation, the social distancing of the pandemic didn't do anything to abate the, the trends of hatred um, that we see. And in fact, um, as you might've suspected, hatred is on sh sharply increasing uh, when you look at it targeting against specific communities, for instance, the Asian Pacific Islander community. Um, but traditionally and consistently over decades, the uh, FBI shows us that uh, not only are Jews more the most targeted among any recorded religious group, 
Jews are actually targeted more than all other religious groups combined. And that's a consistency year upon year, regardless of whether or not the hate crime statistics go up or down. So these are crimes that are committed, but where the primary motivation behind them is hatred towards the person or the perceived uh, identity of the person or institution that you are targeting. Um, so it could be, for instance, you know, a swastika spray painted on the door of a house, um, you know, may or may not be targeting a Jewish community member, but they may think they are, and therefore this is considered an anti-Semitic incident uh, on the part of the FBI, um, you know, in, in, in such an example. Um, and again, ADL does our own tracking of incidents. We also track um, harassment that is legal. So we live in a country where we value and cherish the First Amendment. People are free to express themselves. That sometimes includes hateful and offensive expressions. Um, but we want to be able to track those numbers and see what's been going on. And, and those numbers also show that the last four years are among the highest on record that we've ever tracked. And that's dating back to the 1970s when we first began tracking these incidents. And these include harassment, um, vandalism, and assaults. But it does not include generalized expressions of hatred and bigotry that we experience online. So when you see someone posting something on Twitter or on Instagram um, or a page on Facebook that might deny that the Holocaust occurred or says terrible things about uh, Jews, then we wouldn't necessarily count those as a particular anti-Semitic incident. There's simply too much of it to catalog. Um, so factor that in with all of the other rising forms of hate and we see that we are living through a period of sustained um, and pronounced hate directed at the jewish community um, more recently directed at the asian community um, consistently and most often directed at the african-american community um, but as we know through studies hate rarely confines itself to one category and to one community so if we see hate being directed at one group Invariably, if it hasn't already, it will soon be directed at others. Well, wow. Um, I, I see your logo behind you, ADL, Anti-Defamation League. I mean, I've been familiar with that my whole life and admired your organization my whole life uh, for what it does. But, you know, back in the old days when we said Anti-Defamation League, we were talking about defamation. Um, defamation is not necessarily violent. Defamation is not necessarily hate. Um, and I guess when ADL was created, maybe life was different. Do you think you ought to change your name to adjust to the times, Seth? Well, I'd actually say the, the hatred that we encounter is remarkably consistent. So ADL was founded in 1913 in a time when there were popular expressions of anti-Semitism in the media. Uh, that included uh, newspaper articles, uh, cartoons, songs, uh, depictions in the theater that showed Jews as grotesque caricatures um, and sought to marginalize them in society. And sadly, what we see today is uh, some repeats of some of that same, those same expressions of, of bigotry. We see, um, white supremacist groups um, flyering, uh, communicating over the internet and distributing flyers that um, uh, try to accuse Jews of some of the same things that we heard uh, in the early 20th century, that Jews um, are, are associated with conspiracy theories about um, spreading disease or um, having too much power or maintaining too much control or controlling the government. I mean, these are old, style expressions of anti-Semitism that many people, I think, may have thought were defeated or um, uh, consigned to the dustbin of history at the fall of Nazi Germany. Um, and yet, they continue to persist throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. You know, uh, it used to be that when people really wanted to express vile bigotry and hatred, they would hide themselves behind a hood to have that sort of anonymity. Um, and you think of images of the Ku Klux Klan marching through towns or, or even famous pictures of the Ku Klux Klan marching through Washington, D.C. Um, they would hide themselves because it was even in that, in that time, even at that, at, at that period, um, it was taboo to express such raw hatred. Um, 
And, and now today we find people, instead of trying to hide behind the anonymity of a hooded uh, mask or cloak, they're hiding behind the anonymity that's afforded through the internet, through screen names, um, through social media. And so we see some of the very same kinds of expressions of bigotry uh, coming out today, but just using new technology and new forms to express it. You know, what's coming out today is also an examination of the Holocaust. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's a well, Holocaust Remem Remembrance Day was only a couple of weeks ago, and there's a certain amount of media about it. And I, I wonder how an anti-Semitic person reconciles that. I mean, logically, maybe the wrong way to put the question, but how, how does an anti-Semitic person who um, spends his time doing anti-Semitic things and making anti-Semitic uh, comments and tropes and what have you, um, reconcile that with the Holocaust, where six million Jews were killed? Uh, how, do, how do they see it? Well, we're, we're seeing the confluence of a few things happening right now. Um, you know, one is that uh, the Holocaust is becoming more and more of a distant memory. So um, there are many people who don't necessarily have lived through the experience of, of experiencing it. Uh, moreover, um, the number of people who can bear direct eyewitness to what occurred during the Holocaust, that number is sadly diminishing. The survivors of the Holocaust, um, there are fewer and fewer of them to tell firsthand their accounts of the depravity, the, the, um, the bigotry, um, the mass murder, the genocide that took place. And so those people who seek to inherit the ideology of the Nazis, um, who seek to promote that kind of um, hatred directed at Jews and at others on the basis of religion or race or other markers, um, those people are um, will try to sow some um, uh, some some um, un lack of knowledge of or um, uh, to try to um, promote this notion that perhaps the Holocaust didn't happen as you've been told or didn't occur at all um, to minimize it to trivialize it um, or even as we've seen more recently in the pandemic to exploit it. So we've seen a number of really horrific expressions of bigotry tied to people who are frustrated with the public health response to the pandemic. Um, we've seen it right, right here in Hawaii uh, with responses to the public health response and targeting Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Um, now he became a symbol both because he's a medical professional, but also somebody at the, uh, you know, who's, who's among the leaders um, of the state. Um, and he became a target for a protest. Now that's fine. People have a right in a democracy to protest uh, policies that they think are unfair or unwise. But then what happened was we saw it cross the line. We saw people using um, the Holocaust as an analogy um, to public health measures that are meant to save lives. So here you have an event which was one of the most heinous acts of mass murder in human history being compared to public health measures that are intended to save and preserve life. Um, and you have officials who happen to be Jewish or may not be Jewish at all being um, tagged with these epithets that are used to try to drive home the, the person's point um, about mask mandates or vaccine mandates or other such public policy uh, matters. So Holocaust rhetoric is a convenient go-to for many people because it's very extreme. Um, it's sort of hard to, uh, to, to challenge. Um, and therefore, it's often invoked in some of these more contentious debates. But we would ask people not to do that. It's a trivialization of what happened in the Holocaust. Um, it's, a, it's a complete misunderstanding and misrepresentation of what occurred. Um, and it has no relevance to uh, politics, public uh, policy debates, or the like, um, where it's often being invoked. You know, there was a question, uh, and Peter referred to it briefly, and I'd like to read it to you. It's certainly uh, worth addressing because it's um, hard to answer this question. And it's from one of our other hosts who is an uh, international, international host uh, who lives far away from Hawaii. And he asks, um, how do you explain the rise of intolerance in the United States in recent time? 
is this new greater than before uh, or has has it always been there but now it is more noticeable so the answer is probably yes <laughs> um and uh you know pardon my my glib response but honestly um there has been a an air of hatred that has persisted um, within american society um, it doesn't matter whether you're in the aloha state uh, in the Golden State, in the Empire State, uh, we see these expressions of hatred across the country. Um, and they've been with us for some time. Now, again, as I mentioned, um, at, a cer at certain points in the 20th century, it became more taboo to express these, um, these forms of hatred openly. And so people were less likely to uh, publicly air their bigotry or take ownership of it. Uh, but certainly we've seen that recently, there's been uh, more expressions of hatred, uh, more of a reflection of that. So why is that? Well, there are two real main factors driving this phenomenon. Um, the first is that extremists are feeling emboldened. Um, we saw, particularly beginning with the 2016 presidential election, a coarsening of the public debate, a sort of a normalizing of more extreme speech, of taboo subjects, um, of uh, uh, in, in the name of sort of pushing back against uh, being politically correct, people were saying more and more offensive um, or borderline racist or bigoted things um, in an effort to push the envelope. Now, this normalized for some extremists the ability to uh, publicly express their behavior. And so we've seen that happen with a number of different groups. And we've seen recently a proliferation of various groups under a variety of names. They sort of rebranded themselves as the alt-right to give themselves an air of legitimacy. And they've created new groups and names which may share some of the same hatreds of older groups uh, like Nazis or the KKK, but are um, reformed under new uh, identities, but that still express white supremacy or white nationalism and the like. So you see names of groups like Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, um, uh, the American immigra Immigration Movement, um, a Patri uh, Patriot Front and others um, that have come up as an effort to sort of rebrand white supremacy and white nationalism and extremism in all of its forms. So that's one factor. And the second factor is one that we've already touched on, which is the weaponization of technology. The use of technology by extremists to reach, to recruit, or even to radicalize people who are already um, involved in this extremist thought. So we see not only using the cover of anonymity that we've discussed, but we also see people using technology um, to try to um, sow fear, um, create intimidation. So we, we see that in things like doxing or swatting, doxing being the publication of uh, publicly available documents about an individual to try to intimidate them. So where you might live, where your children might go to school, where you might work, um, you know, other types of information that can be available through public records. They post them on the internet to try to intimidate people, um, to dissuade them from behaving or expressing themselves or associating. Um, and then we see swatting, which is a falsified call to law enforcement to try to elicit an armed response, a SWAT team. We've actually seen this result in death. Um, again, an effort to intimidate people from associating um, or simply from being who they are. Um, so, and we also see technology used to make robocalls or even to live stream terror attacks. Um, so technology plays a very important role and in particular social media in the explosion of hatred and the expressions of hatred that we've seen most recently. Uh, before I, I turn it over to Peter on the local side of things, um, I just wanna ask you one more question. You said that the ADL gathers information um, a, 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 except for social media, which is, you know, uh, so so large, um, but is that information of the names of the people engaged in bigotry and anti-Semitism? Are those names available? Can I look it up somewhere? Can I find out who's on that the list that ADL has prepared? Well, we do provide um, extremism reports uh, for the public, for uh, journalists, and uh, for law enforcement so that they are aware of the groups that are organizing um, that have these uh, bigoted views, and in some cases, uh, try to back up their bigotry with action. 
Um, so you can go to our website, adl.org, um, and you can look up uh, the names of various groups. Uh, I've named some of them today um, that are prevalent in um, expressing bigotry and extremism and, and looking to recruit people to do the same. Um, so there are extensive backgrounders on our website that, uh, again, uh, people can use. There's also a number of different tools that we have and resources, um, including a, a hate symbols database. So you may see um, graffiti um, or tattoos of an individual. You may not necessarily know the meaning. Um, our experts in our Center on Extremism will help to unpack that. Um, we also have a reporting structure online called adl.org slash report, where people can report um, anti-Semitic or other biased incidents that may occur um, so that we can help to uh, track these incidents and again, keep the public informed. But of course, we also encourage people to uh, reach out to local law enforcement whenever they see these acts, even if you think it might be a legal expression. It's important to let law enforcement know, let the professionals decide. Even a legal expression of hatred could be uh, connected to other criminal activity elsewhere or also could be a harbinger of criminal activity that, to come. So it's important also to report these types of things to law enforcement. And you mentioned social media. We are interested in tracking social media. We simply don't cover it in the one report that I referenced, um, but it's also important for you to report hatred directly to social media platforms. Um, it's, it's their responsibility to remove offensive content. They have user agreements. Um, ensure that they are living up to those user agreements. And in many cases, they are depending upon you, the user, to report the hatred to them. So make sure that you do that through their own reporting portals. Well, thank you, Seth. Uh, Peter, let's turn to you. Let's talk about what happens at uh, 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 the, um, the problem as it exists in UH, and the memorandum that you wrote about examples of uh, anti-Semitism and hate crimes uh, here in Hawaii. First of all, it's not just UH. We're talking about the community. Uh, and that's one of the issues. Uh, I think a, a nice bridge would be, Seth, if you could explain two terms for our audience. Um, what is the definition of anti-Semitism? Well, there are, there are many excellent definitions of anti-Semitism. It's um, hatred that's directed at uh, the, the Jewish people or their institutions. Um, it could be because of their religious observance. Um, anti-Semitism can take many forms. Many people mistakenly associate anti-Semitism with only being about Nazism or mass murder, which of course was the most extreme example of anti-Semitism. But there are many forms of anti-Semitism, as with other forms of bias and bigotry, that are much more subtle. Um, anti-Semitism is different from other forms of bigotry in that Jews are often targeted um, as being perhaps too powerful um, or um, exhibiting, uh, you know, or, or having a classic anti-Semitic tropes about Jewish money and control. So anti-Semitism is, is a, a varied and, and diverse subject. It's sometimes called the oldest hatred. Um, and important to remember something else about anti-Semitism, that Jews are a people, not just simply a, a religious group. And so as a people, um, Jews have certain rights and, and um, um, that are afforded to them that other people are as well. And that sometimes spills over into the issue of um, the ways in which um, Jewish self-determination, known as Zionism, is denigrated, or uh, the, the Jewish state, Israel, is sometimes denigrated. Again, not criticism, not legitimate criticism of Israel or Zionism, but rather um, you know, simply saying that Jews have no right to self-determination, which is a, a right guaranteed under international law. Thank you very much. Uh, there are lots of documents out there defining uh, anti-Semitism, the U.S. State Department, the IHRA, there's a New Jerusalem report. Is there a particular document that our audience could go to that ADL uses? Well, as I said, there are many good definitions for anti-Semitism. For you guys, for ADL. Uh, we, we have, uh, we have a, a, a primer on anti-Semitism where we un unpack the seven most common myths about Jews. Um, the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance right. IHRA document is an excellent source, um, but you can also go to ADL.org and search for right. anti-Semitism. We'd like our audience to be able to recognize that one of the difficulties with anti-Semitism is uh, racism against African Americans is pretty clear. Anti-Semitism is not so clear, and that's one of the historical issues. Uh, so that's one of the things I'd like you to clear up for our audience, which you did very nicely. The second question, which is connected, is um, 
you keep referring to uh, lawful hate. <laughs> what is lawful hate? Well, it, again, we cherish our First Amendment rights in the United States. And so it is your lawful right to tell somebody in a public uh, setting that you hate them because of the way they look or the way they pray or who they love. Um, that can be a lawful expression, um, but it can cross the line if you are um, engaging in severe harassment. Um, and certainly if you're committing a crime, as you're saying some of those same hateful statements about who they are, how they look, how they pray, or who they it's love. The, it's the defense that what you say makes me feel uncomfortable. Is that a defense in the, in the view of the ADL? That I'm, discomfort, I'm just that causing discomfort or causing a sense of intimidation is if so facto hate and is that, a, that lawful hate? And you'll see the connections. We only have two minutes left. Yeah, I, sure, sure. I see, yes, I see, I see where you're going. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so in two minutes, um, let me address as Jay asked me to some of our more local issues. And the local issues, while they're connected, they do have a couple of focal points. So at the University of Hawaii, and there's a question as to how many Jewish students there are, uh, UH is not allowed to ask religion in the registration material. So we don't know. Um, we have a minion at current events, which is a nice thing. So one issue is the role of BDS. That is departments, not the university as a whole, uh, either promoting, as in the case of an upcoming event, sponsoring, uh, perhaps teaching uh, BDS, which is boycott, divestment, and sanction. And two of the current pillars are that uh, Israel is a colonial society and Israel is apartheid. So if that is mentioned, spoken about, and a Jewish or other non-Jewish student uh, feels uncomfortable or intimidated without a clear and present danger, without any particular disability, so we're not talking about somebody not writing a letter of recommendation, but what we could say is a general air and ambiance. Is that something that the ADL would consider an act of hate? Well, certainly. I mean, look, the BDS campaign represents a hostile delegitimization um, of a fundamental um, right and rejection of Israel's right to exist, um, which is a right that's guaranteed under the UN Charter. Um, as I mentioned, Jewish self-determination is a right that's guaranteed under international law. Um, and BDS, much to the, um, maybe to the surprise of some people who are um, interested in it, BDS does not promote peace. Um, you know, it does not promote um, dignity or security for the Palestinian people. Right. And we, we, only and have the Israeli people. We, only, we only have a minute. No, let's take and, some extra time, Peter. That's okay. 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 So all that said and done, right? Um, if there is an event uh, and people are made to feel uncomfortable, that seems to be, according to your understanding and the ADL's understanding, not ipso facto an act of hate. Not necessarily. I mean, okay. but I, you know, hate is a very subjective term. Right, but we, so. but we are dealing here, particularly with UH, uh, right. with academic freedom, freedom of speech. Um, so I want us, because a lot of the audience is interested in what precipitated this, is the periodic scheduling of a BDS meeting uh, sponsored by several departments, not by the university as a whole. And the university has several hundred departments. So we're talking about five. Okay, uh, and a lot of the folks in the community would like to know how to respond. But in keeping with that, um, I think ADL and the rest of us have to respect academic freedom. Absolutely. Uh, so that's one, one issue here about anti-Semitism and bigotry is when BDS starts talking in a bigoted, anti-Semitic way. Okay, another one which is uh, clear, and, and Jay and I have talked about this, and you guys have it chronicled, but this is more for our audience. Uh, the 10 to 15 examples of uh, Nazi graffiti, uh, swastikas, et cetera. How should people respond if they're driving down the street and they see that? And they, they will see that here. How does well, the ADL recommend, what does the ADL recommend for folks to do? Certainly, if you see graffiti, if you uh, encounter other forms of hate, um, you should do what you can to ensure your safety. Um, but if it's safe and if it's possible, document what you're seeing, 
report it to an agency like the ADL that tracks it, but also report it to uh, local law enforcement, whether that's campus police, HPD, or, or others, um, so that they're aware of this and they can document and take care of the, the issue themselves. Um, you know, hatred, it's important that people speak out. Um, we, we often ask that people be allies and upstanders to speak out against hate. And it, you don't have to be an expert. Um, again, make sure to maintain your own safety and security. Uh, but if you if it happened, you happen to encounter it, whether it's online or in a group setting, um, you can simply say something as, as basic as, I'm not okay with this, this is hatred, and walk away. And that both um, tells the aggressor of, and the person who's promoting the hate that you're not with them, but also tells the target who may be um, on the receiving end of this hatred that they have allies and that not everybody in the group is going along with whatever hatred is being espoused. Let me return to the third and really, I think, more problematic and difficult situation, which is, I, I hesitate to word, use the word unique, but not something you're going to find in LA or Chicago or New York. And that is Hawaii uh, is permeated with Christian culture. In other words, uh, Jewish families uh, see Easter symbols in their public school classrooms. Uh, gifts are exchanged. There are not meetings on Christian holidays. There was a, a major state meeting on Yom Kippur. Uh, when your a colleague was here, we called that soft anti-Semitism. But it is a denial of the integrity of Jewish religions. I would consider it anti-Judaism as much as anything else. And uh, much of the society here, um, in many ways, and this includes the uh, sovereignty movement, deeply impacted by the missionaries and deeply impacted by a Christian narrative. And that Christian narrative fits clearly into BDS, where the Palestinians are, in fact, the new Jesus. And Jews and Israelis are once again murdering Jesus. Now, what do we do about that? What do we do about a minister who opens a, a prayer meeting saying, that Israeli soldiers have their rifles pointed through an open gate into Bethlehem. What do we do about state holidays? What do we do about families where schools don't uh, pay attention to Jewish holidays and sometimes schedule major events on Jewish holidays? Well, Peter, I think we have to have a whole other show to talk about all of these different expressions of anti-Semitism that you've underlined because they're all, uh, you know, they all have their own character and right. um, association with various um, expressions but I, but I of anti-Semitism over history. Right. People's daily lives. I mean, for people's daily lives, and the people yeah. are asking questions who live here, the last one is actually the most difficult. Look, if you see a BDS meeting, you've talked about how we should respond and what we should look for, okay? You see a swastika. It's upsetting, but you know there are not a lot of Nazis here, right? It's probably uh, a, a relatively um, unusual circumstance. But the C and the DNA, the very blood of our society here, is heavily, heavily Christian. And that heavily Christian um, fits into, I think, Jewish life in a more difficult way than, for example, Confucian or Buddhist life. Yeah, and, and it probably fits very difficultly into uh, Islamic and Muslim life here as well. You know, the, I, I, I think most people have no idea what Ramadan is, and they'd be happy to have a Christmas party you know, on that day. So we'd, we'd, I would like to welcome you back. Um, Jay, I think though that although this uh, maybe isn't as racy and sexy, uh, among the Jews living here, this is the issue, <laughs> that this kind of soft anti-Semitism. Well, it's soft, but uh, if you look at these expressions, you see uh, swastikas and other anti-Semitic indications around right. the Right, but I think those, those are hard. I mean, it's, it, well, it, it emulates yeah. what people hear and see what is going on in the mainland. And so uh, Hawaii is not completely independent no, I, of what's going on in the mainland. I, and I think, I, think, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's value on diversity. Um, you know, a lot of people have been shoulder to shoulder with other races, other religions uh, for 150 years, um, and, and they're not about to single any one group out. However, there are people in our midst who emulate what's going on on the mainland tonight. And I wanted to ask Seth one question, which, which has um, you know, really troubled me. It, it's this. In our, in our lifetimes, at least in my lifetime, um, Jewish people have 
have, have not experienced anti-Semitism in any real significant way. And certainly they haven't experienced anti-Semitism in, in, in terms of violence, you know, as we saw, um, you know, in Pittsburgh, for example, and other places lately. Um, and so um, it just seems to me that there, there must be, and you would be much more familiar, uh, there must be Jewish people in this country who were taking off their, their yarmulkes who are not identifying as Jewish, who are hiding from this process. They do not want to be identified. They don't want to be known in the community as Jewish because the, you know, there's a detriment to that. This is really, really tragic. This sounds like the 30s, you know? Um, but my question is, am I right in making that assumption? Is that true? And what do you feel about that? Well, I think, you know, people have a right to be identified as Jews. Um, people have a right to not be identified as Jews. You have, a, you have a right to your individuality and you have a right to your privacy. Um, those are rights that we cherish in American society. So, um, I, you know, I certainly am not, uh, I, I can't necessarily draw on personal experience to know um, if this is, if that feeling is worse now today than it's ever been. I can certainly tell you that there are people who do hide markers of their Judaism today because of increased incidence of anti-Semitism. Um, I would suggest and I would encourage people, you know, obviously they should do what they feel most comfortable doing, um, but I would encourage people to as much as possible um, to speak up, um, to share facts, uh, to be strong um, and show strength in the face of uh, this kind of hatred and intimidation. What we find is that most people, most people, the overwhelming majority of people do not harbor these feelings of ill will. Most people, um, even some people who go along with um, movements, movements or inclinations that are bigoted against Jews or against others, don't necessarily realize the full weight and impact of what it is that they're doing. Um, so BDS is a great example. Most of the people who are connected to the BDS movement, they simply want to see peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And that's a laudable goal. Um, it's just that BDS is not the path for doing that. It's a one-sided, um, really uh, biased approach to a very complex problem. Um, so I would say, to the extent possible, be proud of who you are, um, live your life. Um, you know, this is sort of one of the things that we used to say when we first encountered uh, terrorism in, in the United States is that we shouldn't let the terrorists win uh, by changing our freedoms, by changing our way of life. Um, but it's also important to be prudent. Um, we do live in an era when we've seen, um, you know, uh, armed attacks against Jews, um, against immigrants um, uh, in this country, against Muslims um, elsewhere in the Pacific, um, you know, where people have been attacked in their houses of worship. Um, so it is prudent to take certain precautions. Um, it is a, a good idea to have a relationship with local law enforcement so that your first call to them is not a 911 call. Um, it is prudent to take other security matters and considerations into, into mind uh, when you're planning your events. And that doesn't mean that you still can't have a warm and welcoming environment and one in which you can live a full Jewish life or Buddhist life or Muslim life. Um, to express yourself as an African American or as a Latino, um, to express yourself as a member of the LGBTQ community, um, whatever it might be, um, I would encourage you to express that. Um, but unfortunately, yes, it's also important to take prudent steps to protect yourself and to be aware um, and to reach out in allyship and in coalition to others um, who can support you. Yeah, we shouldn't hang separately, we should hang together. So we have a question, uh, Jay, before we go, I think we should answer. The first question is, uh, is how many Jewish students or staff are at UH? I think I answered that. We can't, we don't really know. But, but the other is important. What is the precedent for UH supporting Jewish people on campus? What about supporting anti-Israel groups on campus? So as supporting uh, Jewish people on campus, we have, uh, and I hope I'm not boring you, Seth. Sorry, I just want to answer this very local question. But again, a lot of these questions, you know, we live 2,500 miles <laughs> from the coast. So the local really is very important for us. You know, who we rub elbows with. If your kid, if your kid is going to go to UH, is, is your kid going to be bombarded with anti-Semitism or not? So uh, to answer the question, uh, the precedent for supporting Jewish people 
has been uh, taken up by, not by the university, but by Jewish faculty and Jewish students. So we have a Hillel, we have a UH fund for the promotion of Jewish life and studies. Uh, we supported the ADL rep when they were here last time. Uh, we provided the nice uh, food and drink for you, you know, so you guys wouldn't get hungry. Um, so the university doesn't do that. But on the other hand, the university does nothing to keep us from doing that. Now that's a different issue. There are no Jewish history courses. There's no endowed chair. Uh, but by the same token, uh, there's no historian of the Middle East, regardless of their political position. Okay. The second point, though, is important. What about supporting anti-Israel groups? And that's of great interest. If we could see the flyer again, because five departments are sponsoring. So to answer your question very quickly, and we could have another discussion about this, the university as a whole does not support this event. And looking at the flyer, one should not assume that the university supports the event. Individual departments and individual scholars uh, really do make their own decision. There's no cross-campus decision about whether to sponsor or not. But when you see this, please note that it is these departments. And if you want to do something about it, I highly recommend you contact these departments. What departments, Peter? Let's, so let's hear example, the names of the at, departments. If you look at the flyer, they are the usual departments, so ethnic studies. And the former chair of ethnic studies has gone on record saying Israel has no legal right to exist. Uh, he, did, he expressed that in an interview with the student newspaper. American Studies Department, American Studies Association has supported BDS. Uh, they're one of the professional organizations that has. But to answer uh, Ms. Kaplan's question, uh, the deal with the university was they were allowed to house the journal here, but the journal could not follow BDS policy. So if an Israeli or a Palestinian submits an article, it must be treated the same way as any other author. All right, so that was kind of a concession. Uh, the Center for Hawaiian Knowledge. And this has become for the Jewish community a very fraught issue. Um, as Seth and Sean uh, noted, uh, indigenous rights are significant anti-colonialism, and nobody is saying either of those are insignificant. Uh, they're too easily mapped on, though, to Israel. And again, I wouldn't put past the heavy Christian influence at the, at the center of knowledge and in the sovereignty movement, where once again, we're attacking uh, Jesus. Then there are various student groups. Um, they don't have any necessarily official uh, recognition other than, I'm sure, Seth is familiar, every college has a Students for Palestine group, um, and we have, we have one as well. Uh, the numbers are not great, you know, five or six departments out of, I don't know, hundreds of departments, but they are in the places where they often are found on the mainland as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Peter. So, okay. That's really helpful. Um, may I just, may I just I think add that answers one, the question, yeah. May I just, I'll just add one, one quick point. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Hoffenberg mentioned um, uh, anti-colonialism, um, and mentioned indigeneity. You know, if you are a supporter of indigenous people and indigenous rights, and if you are opposed to colonialism, then you should be a supporter of Israel. Not, not agreeing with every policy or every action that Israel has ever taken. Absolutely not. Israel is a democracy like any others that, that is open to legitimate critique and criticism. And you can find more criticism of Israel than anywhere else in the world in Israel itself. It's a free and open and robust civil society. But Israel is also um, the best example of an anti-colonialist project. In other words, a group of people who had been colonized going back to their indigenous place to reclaim their indigenous rights. Um, and there are, and, and I'll leave it at that for now. You can go and do the, the, the study and your homework to find out why. Um, but if, you're, if you are a supporter of anti-colonialism, and if you're a supporter of indigenous rights, then you ought to be a supporter of Zionism and you ought to be a supporter of Israel. Mm. Again, open to the criticism and critique that are legitimate for Israel, for the United States, for France or Australia or China or any other country in the world uh, that deserves to be have uh, criticism leveled at it for its policies and actions on that basis, not to, de not to try to uh, delegitimize it um, or say that it has no right to exist. 
Yeah, two, thank, uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, thank you, Peter. A very valuable discussion. I, I just before we go, before we let you go, Seth, I have one more question I want okay. to put to you, and that's. And I want to make two points, Jay, and then we'll go. Yeah, you go no, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make your okay. points. Uh, so one is that uh, colonial settler society, as the phrase is, is often uh, prefixed with white colonial settler society. So to agree with Seth and bring it home. You can't go to a classroom at the University of Haifa. You can't get on a bus. You can't go to a market. Uh, I, I see no way in which an Iraqi Jew is white. Um, I, don't, I see no way where a Palestinian Christian. So I think one of the difficulties is it's not just colonialism or anti-colonialism, indigenous or not. It is so, somehow the view that Jews are white in Israel. And Israeli society is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. And the final reminder is that uh, Jews have been there in one way or another for over 3,000 years. The term Palestinian was a term that the Romans used for Jews there. So I think what we have is really two competing nationalisms, right? Two competing indigenous groups, <laughs> two competing peoples because the Palestinian Arabs were colonized by the Ottomans. We have two competing uh, narratives, which really are unfortunately very close to being mirror images of each other. And as Freud argued, the most hideous wars are civil wars. And to a certain degree, this is a civil war, particularly at this point, with the Israel being around for so many years and so many people born there. So that was just my, my point, Jay, because you hear with BDS, the colonialism, the white settler colonialism, uh, you hear arguments about taking on indigeneity and that Zionism is not a legitimate nationalism. And it's really like looking in the mirror. It's like two siblings having a battle over the same land and the same uh, water resources. So the, I will quote Yehuda Bauer, the way to get something done is for everybody else to take their fingers out of that pie, including, <laughs> including, including BBS, which has a lot of support here by people who may have known nothing about the Middle East. But Bauer has always said, everybody else should just leave. And the Palestinians and Israelis and Arabs and Druze, like people in Hawaii, we have nowhere to go, right? We have to get along. And On college we, campus, uh, the most important thing in dealing with organizations like BDS is to use critical thinking. And um, it's a challenge um, because um, uh, they got a playbook and you have to really use your kepi in order to deal with some of their arguments. But this is good. We have to have this good discussion. Uh, Seth, I, I want to I want to ask you one more question before we close, and that's this. Um, you are to us uh, and to the mm, the region which you you know supervise the expression of ADL, and you 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 spend your time dealing with um, hate and hate crimes and people who hate and expressions of hate in all forms and anti-Semitism, which is very painful at least for me to talk about. And I'm, I'm sure Peter finds the same problem. It's not pleasant. Okay, um, anyway, and, you know, I enjoy it, yeah. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's horrible, it's twisted. It's, it's, it's the lowest kind of denominator of all. And so I wonder how your life is as a professional dealing with this, thinking about it, seeing expressions of it, seeing a record of it every day. I mean, how does that affect you? Can you get away from that or does it begin to get you down after a while? Well, you know, I think that we are living again through a period where hatred is, um, it's there, it's out there. Um, it's there whether you see it um, uh, etched on the, on the wall, um, whether you see it um, in your social media feed, um, we see hatred and it's being expressed. Um, I derive a lot of uh, satisfaction and inspiration from all of the people with whom I work, um, from the people who file reports with us who are seeking our help and assistance, um, that we can help uh, give them some sense of hope um, or in some cases, some resolution to the hatred that they are confronting. Um, give them the tools to respond themselves, um, bring a community around to embrace them, um, introduce them to coalitions of other people from other communities, other faith groups, 
um, other ethnicities um, to be able to say, we come together and we'll, we'll reject the hate together. So um, I really, my work is, is, is uh, a work about, that's all about hope. Um, that's all about thinking that we can make this world a better place. Um, and I know that we can, and I've seen that happen uh, by working together and by speaking up. So um, you're doing that right here through this show. Um, and uh, I look forward to being able to do that with, with folks uh, throughout Hawaii in the coming months and years. Thank you very much, Seth, thank for you. appearing on Think Tech. Peter, would you give would you give Seth even a greater thank you than I did? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much. And not, not just for sitting through Jay and me, and we don't actually shop at the same uh, store, even though it looks that way, uh, but all, really for all your work to repair the world. Uh, ADL is, and ADL has taken grief for it. So um, ADL has been attacked politically, et cetera. Um, but I think people should know that the ADL tracked uh, white hate crimes when the federal government did not and would not do so. Uh, and so the ADL was way, way ahead of the curve, uh, knowing about uh, white supremacists and, and white hatred. I think people also should know uh, the event that precipitated the founding of the ADL. Can, Seth, can you tell us what that event was? Sure. So this is the... Uh... Uh, at, at the time that the ADL was founded, as I mentioned, there was this air of anti-Semitism prevalent in the United States. And in fact, um, right around the time of the founding of the ADL, there was a, a man who was uh, falsely accused um, of a uh, heinous crime in, in Georgia. Um, he was a, accused of uh, uh, sexually assaulting and murdering a, a young girl. Um, and so he was convicted. Um, and the trial, during the trial, it was even reported in the press um, that the public gallery was rife with people shouting out um, anti-Semitic things, uh, hang the Jew and, and the like was being shouted out over the course of the trial. And even at that time, even in, at, at the uh, turn of the century, um, the trial was viewed to be uh, such a miscarriage of justice that the governor of Georgia at the time commuted the sentence uh, of the young man who had been convicted. Now, the group that um, was behind this was so incensed that the governor would commute the sentence to life in prison that they, and this included um, members of law enforcement at the time, uh, former elected officials at the time, they actually broke into Leo Frank, who's the young man's name, Leo Frank's jail cell, kidnapped him, took him out, drove him across the state and lynched him. Um, and as you would do at any other lynching, um, held a picnic, posed for pictures uh, with his body in the background, as was done at lynchings uh, at that time in the deep south in the United States. This is the only documented um, occurrence of a, of a lynching of a Jew in American history. Um, this was a traumatic event for an entire community. About a third of the population of the Jewish population of Atlanta fled um, in the aftermath of Leo Frank's trial and murder. Um, and since that time, of course, there's been um, evidence to document uh, that he was wrongly accused. Um, that, uh, that these, these people were involved in this lynching. And so um, we've seen where that kind of hatred can lead um, and it can even infect those people who are charged with um, you know, leading our society um, and being responsible for law enforcement. So we understand very well what, where hatred can lead and that's why ADL was founded to fight hate for good. And as our founding charter states to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Thank, Thank you, Seth. I want, I want Seth to know the origins of the and Peter Hoffenberg. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on the show. I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much. Aloha.